Rise for pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Jeff Ranahan, first ward. Jessica Lopez, third ward. Michael Safon, fourth ward. Ann Shershin, sixth ward. Felicia Salvatore, town clerk. John Basie, town supervisor. Mr. Nelson will be joining us shortly. Tonight's agenda, um, we have four presentations tonight. First presentation we have is from the water department. Second presentation will be about the Vassar Inn and Institute. Third presentation will be Salt Point Center. And the fourth presentation will be Hudson Heritage discussion on their sewer. First presentation, Water Department, Mr. Ballard, and Mr. Colgan, come on up. It's all about you. We started this year, um, different department heads coming in every month, discussing what's going on in the department, what they plan on doing this year, and some of the things they have done this year. And this month, it happens to be our Water Department. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Good evening. All right, uh, I'm Keith Ballard. I'm the water superintendent, and this is my deputy, Tom Colgan, my right-hand man. And I want to take this chance to thank the, you know, Jay and the town board for giving us the opportunity to do this presentation on the operation of our department. Uh, can you see that all right? Anybody want to, uh, there we go. There you go. Okay, first off, we'll start with the, uh, the treatment plant. This is where our water comes from. We are joint owners with the city of Poughkeepsie on this plant, which is located uh, on Marist College grounds down by the river. And this is uh, how the operation goes. You know, there's an intake. It starts at the pump station. Then it gets pumped up to the solids contactor. From there, it goes to sedimentation, then the ozone contactors, goes through the biofilters, which there's a pump station right there, and then it goes through the uh, UV. Hmm? UV. The UV. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> and then it gets pumped out of the station into a distribution system for the town and the city. And this chart shows you the usage by customer. You know, the town holds, the town uses 49%, uh, the city 35, and wholesale is 16%. Those are third party customers, which are fed through us. So the original plant was constructed in 1872. It's the first treatment plant in the United States. The current plant was constructed in 1967. The alum sludge treatment plant was constructed in 1987. The town, we became part owners in 1995 and with a purchase of 6.33 million gallons a day. That's where we were allotted. And uh, back in 2004, there was a major upgrade to the plant and our pump station at Fairview to add capacity to the town. The current capacity for the pump station or the treatment plant is 19.3 million gallons a day. Of that, the city gets 10.67 million gallons a day. We get 8.63. We take our water from the mile post 77.2 or 77.2 miles north of New York Harbor. The intake is a thousand feet offshore and 50 feet below the surface. And there's a motley crew right there. <laughs> <laughs> but the top is our three girls who, who do the billing. And um, the, the bottom is, a, look like a bunch of ragamuffins, but they're great guys with a lot of experience. The guy on the left's got 46 years in with the town. Uh, there's another one that has, well, I have 30. And uh, was it Ed's thirty? Ed's thirty. Uh, Tony's got twenty-eight years. So there's quite a bit of experience in there. And uh, 
we went through this mapping program to help, you know, when, once we leave, most of the knowledge is in our head as far as maps mm -hmm. and, you know, what, you know, what pipes are where. All the, all the differences in the system. Mm -hmm. So once we leave, this will give the younger guys a chance to, uh, you know, be able to find out where everything is. All right, the history. Townwide Water was created in 1971, joining the eight existing well districts together. Existing water districts included Hagentown, Presidential Estates, Woodmere, South Park, Canouse, Riverview, Pine Acres, Valley Acres, and Sharon Heights. Parts of our water system date back to the early 1900s. As the town developed through the years, you know, the system increased in size. Town water is available to all town residents. There's a map of the north and south ends of our town. You really can't see it, but if we blew it up, it wouldn't fit. The north's on the left, the south's on the right. And in the middle, you'll see the city. So we surround the city. Okay, our system has roughly 210 miles of pipe. We have a lot of roads, like state and county roads, that have mains on both sides. We have two 5 million gallon water tanks. There's six pump stations. Four pressure reducing stations, like down in New Hamburg, there's over 130 pounds of pressure, so we reduce it down there. You know, close, the lower the elevation towards the river, of course, the higher pressure you're going to get. Our transmission main sizes range from 36 inch to 30 inch, 24, and 20 inch. Distribution main size is 12, 10 inch, 8 inch, 6 four and we have one two inch line <laughs> one straggler which we're hoping to do away with soon okay approximate number of valves in the system is five thousand the approximate number of hydrants is seventeen hundred and there's probably a thousand more on private which are still tied to our system so it's it's probably twenty seven hundred total the water mains consist of cast iron, which is old, brittle, but it still works. Ductile iron is fairly new from 71 up. When we went town wide, everything is ductile iron. It's got a 100 year life on it. Asbestos cement and galvanized. Asbestos or AC pipe, we have very little. You know, we have some down in Riverview Village. That's all asbestos cement. Presidential Estates, yep. Monroe, Cleveland, that area. And also in Thornberry and yep. Bayberry. Mm -hmm. So there's really three developments that have the majority of the one. asbestos concrete. The house services consist of copper, galvanized, and lead. You know, anytime we have a leak on a service, we replace the lead from the main to the curb box. That's where the town's responsibility ends. So we don't try repairing it, we just replace it. Pictures up in the corners where we had to do a two 30-inch line stops um, two winters ago. If you guys remember that winter, the 17-18 winter was brutal on infrastructure. Um, so we had a, a hydrant fail due to the severe frost that we had. Um, so the, the combination effort with sewer and highway um, and an outside contractor, we were able to perform this. and. It was uh, quite a job. It was definitely, it definitely took some time in the negative 10, 20 degree weather we were working in. And there is isolation valves, but that if we shut the valve off, it would have put the whole town out and we would have had to rely on smaller mains, which wouldn't have sufficed. So we were able to just move water around somewhat and uh, we got it done, but it was a struggle. There's eight different types of hydrants in our system. These older hydrants, like the one top left, we can't get parts for, so when that goes bad, it's getting replaced. Okay. The reason there's such a variety of, of hydrants in the system is there were so many different well districts. When Townwide Water came through, these are what was existing there. Um, 
and at that time there was no standard on a hydrant the town used so now there is obviously yeah, now we time, have there is two different types we use Mueller and Mueller and Darling yeah and we stock all the parts to repair all these to limit the amount of time they're actually out of service um, like the dresser hydrant there would be the second one from the right on the bottom they don't even make parts for them anymore mm -hmm. so any chance we get if it's broken it gets replaced I mean, everything operates right now. I don't think we, we might have one hydrant out of service, yep. which is going to get repaired one this of, week. One of our goals for this past year, and we finished it this year, was to, that every t hydrant in the town was in service, operated. Um, it's one of our goals you guys will see down a couple pages, but that, that's since been completed. Um, now it's just a matter of putting all the data into the computer here. And after the service, we have a guy going behind painting them. Yep. Here's one of our, this is our main pump station, which is the Fairview pump station. We could actually pump 19.3 million gallons a day out of that station. That was upgraded in 2004. And average right now, we, we pump probably 6 million a day. Depending on the time of year, summertime, you, you may increase um, or whenever you decrease a little bit, but pretty much it's an average. Yeah, the county. I guess kicked in for this upgrade for the, the pump station. Uh, these pumps we service ourselves. We don't send, you know, we don't get outside contractors. So the pumps itself we rebuild, you know, probably every couple of years. Mm -hmm. We have to put new seals and everything in them. But, you know, our guys do it. They do a great job. And this station runs, like yeah. most of our stations use, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because when I started in 1975, the town was pumping 2 million gallons a day. And after 40-some-odd years, we're pumping six. So it's not really a big change in 40 years, and I don't see it get much more. There's really not a lot of land left to build on. There is land, but it's most of it's not worth building on. Now this is our 44 tank. It's our main storage tank. This controls the pressure throughout the whole town. As you see, it needs a paint job. It was painted last in 1992. And we have two tanks the same exact size, this one and one at Spagenkill. The one at Spagenkill is not as bad because they had to roll that because there was cars and people there. So uh, the paint was thicker. This was sprayed on. No, this operates with our, the Fairview pump station with the, the levels. Um, our pumps kick on high speed when the tank gets to 24 feet. It kicks back on low speed when the tank gets 29 feet. And if you get below 16 feet in that tank, then we start running out of pressure on Route 9. So we, we got to keep it fairly full. And plus, we're supposed to have a day and a half of storage. So we have to keep both of the tanks filled. But we move the water in our spackle tank weekly, keep it fresh. These are some of our booster stations. The uh, top is, that looks like Spring Street. Spring Street, yep. Yeah, I can't read that. <laughs> <laughs> Darn computer guy. And the bottom is Spy Hill. As you see, we keep them pretty clean. Their booster stations, they, they boost up the pressure for Spy Hill, McIntosh, Spring Street boosts the pressure for everything north on 9G. Um, yeah, Spy Hill, since it's such a high elevation, it's pretty close to what the, the tank is. So up on top, they have, without the booster station, they might have 20 pounds, which is the Board of Health requirement for entry point into the foundation is 20 PSI. But every 2.31 feet you go up, you lose a pound of, of pressure. Uh, that one on the top left is Edwin Booster Station, which is Arlington Hunt. That's probably our newest one. Mm -hmm. And we do have one that's going to be constructed out of Stratford. We got the plans, reviewed them, so that should be coming soon. And uh, we've rebuilt the pumps on that. The electric motor is new. Down below on the left is our Woodland Pump Station. We just put new pump in there last year we installed it ourselves and we're going to put another one in this year that's the one with the gold motors a new one the one to the left would be where we're replacing this year and the generator we had installed uh, a couple years ago so we only have one station left 
that does not have backup. And we've got the money in the budget for this year. So that's going to be going out to bid eventually. And this is our equipment. This is Which, a backup pump station. It's our main station. Yeah, you'll see the difference in the tank, that in the 44 tank. This one, it's got a little surface, but that'll, we're going to pressure wash it. Most of that will come off. But that was painted by, with a roller, so it's very thick, and that's why it lasted longer. This is our telemetry we look at every day. It tells us what pumps run at Fairview, what the, uh, the county line is pulling, where our tank level is. Just gives our general overview of what's going on in the station. And we also get that on our cell phones. Yep. We get the same screen comes up so we can check on, you know, if there's anything going on. Keep, keep and our main pump station, again. if we have a problem, the, the city treatment plan calls us because they're 24-7 and they monitor it. So we've got pretty good backup. Uh, here's a few of our jobs. The left is we had that bad storm a few years ago. It took down the power lines, fiber optics. So we put everything underground, it's like a thousand feet. The road got destroyed. So we, uh, Mark was good enough to pave it for us. Then the uh, next picture over, that's one of us working on one of our water main breaks underneath the highways. It's Taft Avenue. The highways, big drainage. There's like 30 something inch drainage, I guess. And uh, to the right is a gas main that's being held up. Yep. They seem to like to put utilities right on top of us, mm. make it a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, it's never easy. If it's easy, it's, I think something's really wrong. And all the way to the right is what we call a ringer. It's where the crack goes completely around the pipe. And normally we just clean it up. We keep pressure on it like that so we don't get any dirt infiltrating into the pipe. And we'll put a stainless steel clamp on it, which is stronger than the pipe. That's cast iron. Ductile iron does not break. It blows holes in it. And here's some of our reading equipment. The meters up on the upper left-hand corner is the old Rockwell meters that we're transitioning out of the system. We've been doing this for a long time. Um, the next picture over from left to right, second picture, that's a Rockwell remote. If you have one of those on your house, that's what we're trying to get out of the system. So mm -hmm. we are... Do yeah. We do this stuff, no charge, and try to make it more efficient for everybody. Because um, they have a circuit board inside, and it gets corroded, and it'll give you a false reading. Like the newer stuff, if it's not working, you won't get a reading. So it's easy to repair, but this will give you a false reading. Then it will show up in our high-low report when we do the billing. We have to go back out and check it, and we're just trying to get rid of them. Our reading equipment is not compatible with those. So we have two handhelds that cannot be replaced. They don't make them anymore and you can't get parts. We've scavenged them from probably all over the country just to have two that works. The, so, uh, as you can see in the lower right hand corner is what we use with the outside readers. Um, underneath that is what the center picture is, the black one that's what's underneath. That's the way you can manually read it if you want or you can use a radio depending where we're at in the town with the upgrades. Um, Obviously, town population is about 44,500 people, which we have 10,723 active accounts. Um, all meters are read four times per year. Uh, last year, we installed about 180 meters. This year to date currently, we're about, well, probably about 170, 160 now, um, since when I did this a couple, week and a half ago. Um, and we've been upgrading this since the early 2000s. It just takes time. You have to work around everyone's schedules and things of that nature and people some people just refuse to let us in correct um, outside the district we provide water back to the city of poughkeepsie in parts where we feed them because they have a lower pressure and so um we feed town of high park ibm east fishkill and down the road with potentially other neighboring municipalities are going to be one hooking up to us now these municipalities are built through the joint water board not through us and one thing I can say about the, the remote on the right-hand side bottom, it is called a smart point remote. It's not a smart meter. That thing only comes on, you get radio waves at it for less than a second. Our readers, when they hit the button, turns it on, reads it, and turns it off in less than a second. And that's four seconds a year. So I know a lot of people were concerned about the radio waves coming off it. It's not good for their health, but... Unlike 
the city who has FlexNet, their meters run constantly, like the electric, the smart meters. Ours is not set up to do that, and we don't really want to do that just for that reason. And that's more expensive system, and the upgrade you have to do to it as far as software is just every six months you got to update the software. So we found that it wasn't really a viable option for us to do. <clears throat> as you can see the picture here, somebody hit a hydrant on Boardman Road, oh. which is off oh. our 30-inch water main. So oh. it blew it right off the 30-inch water main. Oh. Went the wrong way. There we go. So that was on a Saturday. We had a crew come right in, and we fixed it, put a new hydrant on in probably about four or five hours. Wow. So these guys are pretty good. And daily operators, we have appointments for uh, meter changes. We have usually two guys read meters for the first part of the week, then they go do hydrants the second part when they're finished with the route. We have different routes that we read every week, and we bill uh, usually a month after they're, they're uh, read. Uh, we got the utility markouts. We do we, basically every underground utility has to mark out. Um, emergency markouts that come in all hours of the day. We have a pretty good system with Frank Ozani. Uh, he gets a phone call. I get an email. We communicate. So the sewer department knows what guys they have to send out. We know who we have to send out. Mark gets a call. So we're all pretty in touch with Central Hudson and whenever there's a problem going on out there. Um, but year to date, so far as year, we're up almost to 1,000, if not there by now. Um, Probably a good 90% of them we have to respond to because you know, obviously town water is available for everyone, so we're on pretty much every road there is. Um, so it's uh, on top of the new installation work. If you look down the bottom or center screen there, that's us doing a 8-inch tap file here for Eastdale last week, um, giving that complex water so they can continue on their construction and move forward. And we got our billing that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis, our, our backflow prevention monitor, monitoring, and leak detection. Um, we do that nonstop. And it, it's paying off because, uh, as you see in the annual water quality report for 2018, we are operating at a 1% loss, which is unheard of. Industry standards, 15%. Anything over 15%, you really have to have a survey. It's called the whole system leak detection. The city does it every year. They're over 20%. But uh, we've got it down to 1%, which is a good credit to my guys. I mean, when we have a leak, within an hour it's shut off. And usually four to five hours, it's fixed and back on. And in the middle of all of our daily operations, we had the emergency work in of water main breaks, service leaks, frozen meters, Cars versus fire hydrants, emergency markouts, no water calls, low pressure, dirty water calls, station failure, unplanned shutdowns, assisting highway and sewer. So you add that into our daily. You know, you start out with one plan, and by the time the day's over, you got a whole other plan going on. But and any emergencies we have, uh, especially after hours on weekends, they call the town police, and the town police call me or Tom. And then we'll get a crew in right away. Yeah, as you can see. Or it might be just two guys. If emergency mark out at night, I have two guys going out for safety reasons. You, got, you mark it out. Our means are in the road, so I don't need anybody getting run over. Yeah. And you see, last year, 2018, we had 37 water main breaks. After our flows, it's 27. That's your holidays, your Super Bowl Sundays, or all times when it's never convenient. <laughs> um, this year so far, with the 19 and 17 after hours, uh, 2018, we did 180 meter changes. Uh, today, we're about 169. Um, remotes upgraded and replacement, 227 last year, 173 this year. So we should be pumping average of 6 million gallons a day. Uh, just kind of just some running stats. Keith just spoke about where we operate at. Um, next. All right, here on the left, you'll see it's one of our jobs in the middle of the winter. Which one was this, Ennis Avenue? Or? Uh, I'm not sure where we're at on that one. 
Uh, but we go out and organize weather. We just don't shut it off, say, well, we'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> it, no matter what it's doing, it gets fixed right away. Once we start, we don't stop. In the middle picture, like I said, we service our own pumps. And normally most people have a, a contractor come in and do it. We save the town a lot of money by doing it. I have a lot of skilled guys. We've been doing it for years. Yeah, and the picture to the right is us. Uh, we're working ahead of highway because we're, we're paving Hagen, Hagen Drive. So we're working at an intersection of Bird and Hagen, rebolting up uh, bonnets and make sure replacing operating nuts. Um, just the kind of things that before the. Yeah, because we had one of the valves was leaking and you really had to snap it all the way open to get it to stop leaking. So we knew there was a problem with it. So instead of waiting until after they pave, which Mark is very excited about. <laughs> right, Mark? We, uh, we're going ahead of them and digging up valves that we know there's might have an issue with or if there's a rounded nut. We have a crew going around cleaning out valves all the time, make sure we can get on them, make sure we can operate them. Some of the operating nuts become rounded where you can't get on them. That, we have to dig them up and replace the operating nut. But the year, a lot of the bolts were rotted right off. Like that one valve, I think, only had two v bolts left holding it. And when they blow off, it's like 30 feet in the air, the water goes. Mm -hmm. And the road goes with it. But this is just kind of pretty standard operation for what we do and trying to stay ahead and keep moving forward. All right, we had some goals. Oh, oh. yep. Is that another one? Another That's leak. The same one. I'm trying to go down to do it. All right, the goals accomplished and goals going forward 2018. Repair and replace the driveway at Route 44. That's done. Install electric service and uh, fiber optics. That's done. Install new ultrasonic telemetry at 44 tank. That was done. We and used to read the tank and with the pressure gauges, how it, how it all registered And they were not itself. accurate. And yes. So. And every time there was a lightning hit, they get destroyed. Now they're lightning protected. And uh, we have an ongoing valve program, as I said before. We have a crew going around. All they do is check out valves. If it's full of dirt, they blow them out. We have a tool that goes on a compressor, it blows them out, and we get on the valves. Operator makes sure they're good. And uh, any broken valve caps or risers, we replace them. And we're doing this all over, not just working ahead of Mark. But this is every day. It's an ongoing thing. This is we we work with the sewer <laughs> department a lot using their vector truck for uh, hydro excavation. Um, it's definitely a way cleaner operation, less disturbance, everything. That's last week, right there's a, that's a curb box in the middle. That's a water shut off for a resident's house. Um, we were doing a meter change and went turned the water back on and it didn't turn back on. So, <laughs> we, which uh, happens quite a bit. Yeah. So that's we we like to call Franco a lot because that vector truck makes life a lot easier. Uh, over here on the right side, this is uh, what happens when ductile main breaks. It, does, it just blows a hole, sometimes usually like a uh, size of your fist. Um, and then obviously a water service right there. Up on top, that's one of our easements we were working in. The water main runs right underneath the drainage. Um, and right next to the sewer. Yep, right next to the sewer. So we were usually on easements, we run right all together. Um, It's another form that picture in the center is when the uh, the cast iron main splits longwise. So that usually adds a little bit of a job, a little more time to our jobs. Um, so it's uh, when you have to replace pipes, a little bit more of an operation. Uh, the picture to the left, that was Stephen Court two winters ago. That was the middle of our marathon. We were on Fulton Street. We were on Stephen Court. We were on Flower Hill, all leading up to the problems we had on our 30. Uh, I said that, that winter really pushed us pretty hard. Toll. Yeah. By the end of winter, you're tired. On the right-hand side was out off 44. That was a hole in the pipe. That's what a, a hole like the size of your fist will do right there. Yep. Blows up right through the ground. A lot of leaks we we find through leak detection because they don't surface. Like Hagentown's all rock, so we go in there quite a bit, and we listen on every hydrant valves. If, normally you could hear it, and then we can correlate it. We have equipment that we correlate. It'll tell you within a foot or two where the leak is. We go from valve to valve. 
and it's really nice equipment and the guys learned how to use it and they're very good with it. Okay, our accomplishments, our goals going forward, we update our office. You know, we uh, redid the floor. It was all carpet and air over top of concrete, and it was just disintegrating. I mean, every day there was dust all over the computers. So we uh, had epoxy floor put in, mm -hmm. which turned out beautiful. And at the same time, we inherited a bunch of new desks and stuff from the, the sheriff's office. So it really kind of all came together at a, a very good time and gave us a new look and really uh, spruced the place up a little bit. And uh, there's a four-inch water main on Cottom Hill that broke over the winter. Uh, it runs through the people's backyards. It's old, old. It was for the old well district. And what we'd like to do is reconnect those services to the eight-inch water main that's there in the front and abandon that four-inch main because we actually have to go through people's yards and destroy them. That was in the middle of the winter, I think, that mm -hmm. happened. Yeah, no, it's like... 20 degree night, negative 20 degree night. And some guy that was running a backhoe sort of hit the main and broke it the rest of the way. Yeah, and that was gone. That was me. So, but it was already broke. Yeah, <laughs> we just broke it more. Um, we're in the process of organizing to get a new storage tank up on 44. That way we can take the 44 tank offline and do some updates on that inside and out, put an aeration in it. Um, to help us deliver a, a better product. Um, yeah, the aeration reduces disinfection byproducts. So it would be a big help. I mean, right now they're down to a lever, level which we've never seen before. They're so low. This uh, new system they put down with the ozone and uh, activated carbon filters and the UV, we went from probably averaging about 8.0 down to four it cut it in half eight's the limit over that you're at your in violation actually it's point zero zero eight we completed the the fire hydrant servicing and data program we were working on uh, it took us two years and we got that done we're, we're in the process of figuring out we want to put a second feed in the bradley village and reconstruct the existing feed um it used to be fed with like a couple old meters in there, and we want to take that out. But we got to tap into 9G and run, give it another feed in order to do all that. Because um, so. they have no volume in air whatsoever. You open a hydrant, and people are out of water, and it just gets dirty very fast. So there's all two four inch meters that fed that because they used to be fed from the city years ago, and instead of Taking them out, we're just going to bypass, do a couple wet taps, bypass that way we can keep them in service while we're doing it. Once we do the bypass, then we could uh, work on those meters. We'll probably just leave them in. It's not going to hurt anything. Oh. But that's uh, we've got many complaints from the fire department about the volume of water in there. And we got to we want to rebuild both of our pressure reducing stations on the south end, the Sheaf Road and South Gate. Oh, uh, we'll work with the fire departments. I was talking to Jeff the other day about it. Um, you know, if there's hydrants need to be in, in certain locations that they feel they're it'd be important. Um, something I want to move them forward, try to try to do. And we're moving and replacing the old hydrants that are outdated. We can't get parts for. Um, we started an easement restoration program. We got about 70 different easements that we've run through people's yards, backyards. All over the place, under um, pools, under, yeah, under pools, under decks, under sheds, everything. Um, to get them straightened up, because I'd rather get in working these easements now when we're kind of in control of the situation, worse in the middle of winter when we're in there because something blew apart and I'm trying to fix it. Um, I mean, we started that this year with the one that Mark was working on over in uh, at the end of Kent and East Arnold. That how we can get in there, we can get the valve, makes it a lot easier. Um, we'll upgrade telemetry. We're always looking to do that moving forward. Um, we want to climate control the Fairview pump station, do the electronics that's in that station now, and the heat that goes. It just uh, the, the it's the variable speed pumps has got 
fans that blow on it to keep it cool. It's not enough. We've had to replace the fans on two pumps. Did he do all three? Yeah. All, right. all, all, all pumps are all done. Three are done. That's all. But three fans they, per pump. Uh, they actually, when you're pumping six million gallons a day, when that pumps deadheads and stops cold, it's not a good thing. So uh, that's one of our upgrades. We'll work on a couple different steps over the course of the next year or two to uh, to do. And uh, we got some upgrades to SPAC and Kills Pump Station we still want to do. Um, the continuous meter upgrading, that's just an ongoing thing. The continuous valves, that's a ongoing thing. And the valves are really important because like now this time of year, they operate easy. You can get to them. But when you add the ice and everything's being frozen, that, that's when it really becomes important because uh, everything fights you. It's not It's not easy. Yeah, if they're full of dirt and that yeah. fridge, just forget yeah. it. And that's time. You know, we have to move back and put more customers out of water. Yeah, and you keep you keep spreading yourself farther and farther back than where you started. Um, so it's it's really important. I always I always come up with a saying that there's no valves important until it's important. No, well, that's that's why because you can drive by a valve in the street or, or by a hydrant valve and say, ah, oh, I probably never use that. And then you're there one night and it's not so nice out, and you're saying, well, I'm really glad we took care of it when we did. Mm -hmm. So. And we're also going to start working on our bigger valves, like on the 30. They're all butterflies, which uh, was not a very good design, but it is what it is. They, to open and close a butterfly valve, there's a gear, and then there's a threaded rod. That's what moves the flapper valve open and closed. Well, that threaded valve, they saw fit to use galvanized, and it's rotten right out. Every time we shut one off, we have to dig it up because we snapped that rod. So we replace them with stainless steel. But like down on Spring Road, that job we had down there, Jeff, we had to dig both of those 20-inch valves up and repair them open, just so we could open, open them back up. Because we can close them and open them manually, but it's very tough to do with that much pressure on one side. And the biggest goal on the bottom is survive the winters to come. And this is just a... Finishing up with a couple more pictures. This is the Flower Hill um, from our couple pictures back when we had our marathon going on. We tend to have marathons sometimes, two to three going on at one time. Yep. Um, and this just and it's usually in November and early part of December. Then it calms down for a while. Then when stuff starts thawing out, the ground starts moving, we'll get a few more. Most of them are in just in the end of November and December. That's all, folks. Thanks, all right, what I would just like to end with is I want to thank Tom. Tom did a lot of work on this, and as you see, he's going to be a good replacement when I leave. <laughs> I depend on him greatly, very intelligent, and he's going to make a good boss. And I just want to thank you guys again for giving us the opportunity. No, thanks for coming to do this because I think some of the residents don't understand, you know, what you guys endure on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's nice to see what you actually do and what it entails to get the water from starting point to the finish point that it's just not a, a pipe in the middle. You, you did fail to mention you do show up at a lot of local fires and help the fire departments keep the water pressure going. Yeah, that's just part of the job. But a lot of people wouldn't know that unless they were at a fire. <laughs> yeah. I mean, every time they get a big fire, usually 911 calls me, and I usually go up and Tommy. Well, these are things people That way we get my ideas so. where they can pull off a hydrant that's got more pressure I just say shouldn't pull from because they're going to collapse the main. There's not many of those. And actually with our telemetry, um, with some of our stuff, we're actually able to kind of get an idea of how much water gets used, too, during that mm -hmm. fire incident. Yeah, like we had that f the first fire up to the state hospital. They used 3 million gallons of water to put it out. Mm -hmm. When the place on Salt Point, um, yeah. Gleason's place, we had that fire earlier this year. That was about 500,000 gallons of water. Hmm. To that fire out. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Keep just, the just a quick question. It was a great presentation. Uh, when you talked about in the process of another tank to replace or to add a third one, add a third yeah, one. Yeah, that's third. what I thought. Because yeah, I know you're saying uh, right about now we we don't have enough storage. Yeah. You're supposed to have a day and a half storage, yeah. and with the volume of water we put out, oh, yeah. if something happens to the city plant, it's going to be less than a day and a half. We'll be out of water or future growth. 
That's still future possible growth. right now. Yeah. So you're looking at another 5 million gallon tank? Is that what yes. you're for? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And that gives us the, the ability to update the other tank and give it what it needs to do. And then from there, go do a spat kill tank. You know, it's kind of like all in conjunction with each other. Pleasant Valley and LaGrange have interest in hooking up to us. So that, that it's really a no-brainer. It's just getting the, the money for it. Yep. Jeff, we applied for a shared service grant between Dutchess County Water, Wastewater, Pleasant Valley, and ourselves to do a study about putting the five, 5 million gallon tank okay. alongside the other one. And it would be like the sewer department. When you get into the system, you have a buy-in. That's probably what we'll have to do. So everybody's paying their fair share. Yeah. But it'd be a big, big benefit for the town of Poughkeepsie. Go ahead. Any Thank more you, questions? Gentlemen. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good presentation. Vassarin. <laughs> gentlemen, welcome. Good evening. I'm um, Brian Swart out from the Va from Vassar College, and I'll be kind of kicking this off. And Ken's here with me to help with some of the technical questions if you have any. Uh, so first, thank you for the time to talk through this request. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about a potential update to the zoning. Um, Vassar submitted a project to the planning board for a hotel and conference center, which we're calling the Indian Institute recently. And going through that process, it was identified that the project didn't technically fit within the language as written for the institutional zoning and the planning board recommended we make some slight modifications to it. So tonight we're asking that the uh, conference center and hotel use be added as a permitted use to the institutional zone. Uh, that will that code update will reflect what's going on nationally in the uh, educational market today there are a number of hotels or excuse me colleges that own hotels or are developing hotels now to support and augment uh, their campuses as um, you know so support their community and their mission it's also represents what we're doing with alumni house now it's just the project is just going to enhance the services that that building offers us now so you might ask, why build a hotel? You know, why is a college building a hotel? And there are a number of reasons why colleges are doing it. Uh, for Vassar, it's largely because higher education is under attack, specifically liberal arts institutions, small ones like Vassar. You look at the high cost of education, the changing job market, and a lot of people are asking and questioning the value and return on investment that you get through higher education. So Vassar wants to take a lead role in shaping that conversation and demonstrating the value, particularly of the liberal arts. So the institute part of this project will allow us to curate programs, leveraging our great faculty and the research that they do, you know, gathering experts from the local community, the national community, to talk about some of the issues that are kind of challenging topics of the day and, and demonstrate how a liberal arts approach of looking at all aspects of the pro of the issue from all different angles and all different sides and researching it can actually allow us to make progress in some of these topics. So what do I mean by a challenging topic? Some of the things in the news today could be things like trade, immigration, you know, some of those things that are kind of polarizing the community and we want to actually cause people to have a dialogue to then think about them from different angles and find some common ground. And so that will help us to demonstrate to the world and the nation that liberal arts education is worth the investment and can be useful for many things just beyond what some people might interpret. Um, so we think that this conferences will draw speakers and participants from all over. Um, and as we have kind of recognized more recently that we've been very inwardly focused and we're starting to make progress towards getting kind of outside the bubble, as some people might say, this is one of those ways where we can kind of participate both locally and nationally. Some of the other reasons to build a hotel, uh, we have a large number of visitors each year, whether they're coming for admissions guests, the prospective employees, or speakers, and there isn't a high quality place for them to stay near campus. You can go over to Route 9 or maybe down to Fishkill, um, but right now what we're finding is many of our prospective <laughs> students will come for the tour, 
um, go to their admissions meeting, and then go on to the next college where they're planning to visit. And we want them to stay because we think this is a beautiful area, whether you're talking about Vassar or nearby or just Dutchess County. And if we can get them to stay a little extra time and spend a little more time here, they'll fall in love with it and become an applicant, become a student, or become an employee, depending upon what their reason is for being here. And so this project will create the, opp create the opportunity for them to do that. We also don't have good meeting space on campus. Um, you know, given the age of the building and the way in which you know our operations have evolved, this we're just kind of fitting things into spaces, and this will allow us to have that space that we need to do our the the day to day business, but also convene um, educational conferences that will allow us to interact with other institutions here on campus instead of just traveling to them as well. Uh, and finally, we also think that this project will have some benefits economically to the area. The Institute program will bring other higher education conferences here, as I just mentioned, bring new visitors to the area that will spend money and hopefully walk to the Arlington area and shop and dine. We expect more of our current visitors will stay longer and do some of the same things of shopping and dining in the area. And while it's not going to be a super high-end hotel, it is likely going to be the highest quality hotel that exists in Dutchess County today. So we think that that's a bit of an amenity that will be for Dutchess tourism in the area to uh, attract perhaps a different clientele. And, and finally, if we can execute the Institute program well, we think that this could bring some positive national attention to this area. I know that there was just a Times article this morning that talked about how Poughkeepsie is up and coming, and this is just another opportunity to show the value of what Poughkeepsie has to offer. So with that, I'll turn it over for any other questions. <coughs> There it is. Uh, so I'll just give you a, a short rundown of kind of how we got where we are with the design. Um, we've been working with uh, both the college, uh, the DOT, and, and the town planning department uh, through several iterations up and down and around in this area here. Uh, the choice of the project to be here really was centrally located both about this, the business district here as well as a connection to the campus here and well as keeping that alumni, the history of the alumni with regard to uh, its same type of operations. As Brian pointed out, they would coexist and work together to, to uh, supplement each other. Uh, <coughs> we originally had this building situated a little further north uh, up towards the intersection through multiple dis uh, discussions with both the DOT and the town. Uh, access was a real problem as we get up to this part because of the uh, complexity of the pedestrian and traffic movements in this circle here. So we started to look at alternate locations. Uh, bringing it further down made the most sense. Um, we looked at bringing it across, but what it started to lose is that, uh, as you can see from this kind of presentation picture, is that kind of connection to both the Green and the community and the Raymond Avenue. Uh, the business district up here by kind of tucking it around the corner. So we ended up moving back out into this area here. So it both kept the green space alive, which will remain the farmer's market and all that will still remain in place. There is uh, currently uh, some proposed uh, geothermal wells that'll be underground, but it will be no effect uh, of the su surface above. And in actuality, one of the uh, benefits that we have now of doing this is all of the surface drainage comes down through and kind of sits in that grass area. Um, historically, the uh, farmer's market has moved north to south depending on how wet the lawn is uh, out there. So part of what we're, we'll be able to do is, is create a, a bypass drainage system around and, and create some movement for that stormwater uh, around. Uh, also, this area that is currently lawn from the years of the vehicular traffic on it and everything like that, it's highly compacted, so there's not as much infiltration into the ground either. So by, in, by pulling it up to redo for the geothermals, replacing it with, with the soil and decompacting the surface, it'll also promote more infiltration in there and create a better connection uh, for that into the future. Um, overall, the project uh, is just over three acres uh, of total disturbance, and that includes this part of the lawn. Um, the, the whole lawn is just about one acre 
uh, total, and we're almost remaining, when you look at the greens here and there, almost remaining about 0.9. So most of the lawn remains, for the most part. The area where the inn sits here is tree-covered as it is now, and is really, because this is that existing walk that walks through, and there's some trees in there. So the real only area that they would use is really up here now. Um, there, the Williams house here, and there's another residence here, they would be uh, removed. Uh, the residents there, uh, Vassar has uh, alternate locations for them on campus. There's adequate housing. Um, most of them are professors and, and or other uh, employees of Vassar that have housing. There's other places for them to, that they'll be relocated on the campus-owned properties. Um, we're providing parking, both some on-street and off-street parking. Uh, we're working here. There's currently uh, on-street parking on college. It's not really signed and not really well defined. Um, working with the traffic consultant, uh, Mazer, to co come up with a better plan to just kind of lay that out so that it's a little clearer uh, with a little more signage uh, as well. I think that's all. <laughs> Anybody board any questions? Yeah, obviously people are upset about the Williams coming down and you are going to have to take care of them and find them adequate housing. So, and so you do have existing housing stock you say you can put them in? Right now, with our expectation is we will be able to take care of that. Um, we do have a, a housing stock. Now we're evaluating all of that, and we may end up making some changes to it as we go forward. Not as, we're not proposing anything as part of this project, but we are definitely looking at our faculty housing and what we might end up doing with it. 50 room in, is that, that seems like it's a little low for the amount of people you might have at a conference. Why that number? It's small scale for a couple of reasons. One, um, you know, the size of the area in which we can build, there's only so much space. And if we were to put five or six stories there, it just would stand out and not really fit in with the neighborhood. So we're trying to size this to be uh, the right scale for us as well as the scale for the neighborhood. Um, and that just kind of seemed about right. So yes, there may be some conferences and actually likely will be conferences that will need more than 50 rooms, but there are other hotels that are in proximity that we might be able to partner with when the time comes for those. Uh, but it also, if you think about the, the sizing of the um, conference center space, the largest conference would have 150 participants. And a number of those would be coming from the campus as well. So not everyone who's going to participate in these events will be coming and spending the night. Uh, hopefully there will be some from the local community, also from the Vassar community. And how many parking spots are you looking to take up on the, on the road way in front? We're, we're putting 60 on the parcel, okay. and they're looking at about 30 or so, 35 on street parking. We've done some discussions both with Vassar and the town, uh, sorry, the DOT, about availability of spaces. They've done some counts. Uh, as we are moving forward with the next submission to the planning board, we have a presentation. Part of that is, is that documentation of some parking calculations on the availability of space. Um, to complement, the parking there is not overnight parking. Um, so conference center hours would not be overnight, so it would supplement kind of just the way the business district is during normal hours that that would be used, and then during the night hours they'd be free again, just like normal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? And, of course, we want to see minimalized use of the green space because it's a great lawn and there's precious few of them left, so... The least amount of building and taking up is, of course, That's what I was going to say is that that's the number one misconception and concern that I have heard is that this inn was going to be built on the alumni lawn. Uh, so it's nice to hear that the majority of that would remain in the yeah, if, market, could stay intact. And Well, Ken gets up to point. I'll just <laughs> say that's always been one of our goals is to preserve that. And that's part of how it got shoehorn, you know, kind of put to where it is so that it yeah. will preserve as much of the green as possible. As you can see, you know, this is the lawn that's there mm -hmm. now, and that would remain. So the majority, like you said, is is going to remain open. Um, as we said, it, it, Brian just noted, you know, we were we've actually gone through, even in our design development stages, of trying to reduce the building square footage as well, even just even small increments, but uh, everything counts, like you said. 
All right. And also, I have an email here from um, Miriam Rossi that I shared with the rest of the town board stating her concerns. And there's also some people here from Beth who would like to speak. So are you going to open up at the end? At the end, we'll be open to speak. Okay, so there'll be time to speak at the end. Yeah. Anybody else? No. Gentlemen, thank you. And Great. we'll get back to you. Thank, thank you. Salt Point Center. Good evening, sir. How are you, Rich? Rich Ryan with uh, Cartel Companies. I have uh, a handout for the board. I think I have enough for everyone. Thank you. Sammy, I can hand them down if you want. Thank you, sir. Thank you again very much. Um, again, my name is Richard Rang. I'm with the Kirchhoff Companies. Um, I think I uh, know some of you. Uh, I'm involved with the East Dell Village Project and the McDonald Heights Town Center um, with, that Joe Kirchhoff is developing now. Um, this particular property is uh, in the Salt Point Center District, which is located on uh, Salt Point Turnpike in the vicinity of Innes Avenue um, and wraps around, I believe, the Creek Road. Um, in your handout, you'll see a, uh, an overall zoning map in red uh, on the northern section of it. Uh, right at the northeast corner of the city of Poughkeepsie is the uh, identification of the zone. Um, there's a blow up on the next page. shows you the property involved as well as the entire zone. Um, the property involved is uh, directly opposite uh, Innes Avenue on Salt Point and consists of probably... Uh, about 40% of the total uh, area in the district itself. Um, back in 2007, when the town adopted their comprehensive plan, uh, they developed, I believe, five town center zones. Uh, McDonald Heights, which is currently under development on Route 44, was one of them. Salt Point Center District was one of the other ones. Um, and we're here tonight to talk about our plan for the Salt Point Center District. And uh, as some of you may be aware, I think you're all probably aware, um, when we initiated the development of the McDonald Heights tenor, uh, Town Center Zone, uh, as the first applicant to utilize a new zoning district, we came across some anomalies within the, uh, the writing of the district and some changes were made. Um, certain of those changes are being proposed now for, uh, for the Salt Point Center District to make it developable the way the, uh, the town had envisioned it to be developed. So, On the next uh, page in your... Uh, and your package is uh, uh, an aerial view, again, showing the location of the Salt Point Center District as well as the property involved. And you see in the, uh, within the boundaries of the district, um, obviously, is the property we're talking about then extends and wraps around that uh, panhandle from the city of Poughkeepsie, includes the uh, um, Lakeview uh, facility that's uh, looking over Morgan Lake on Creek Road as well as the industrial properties that are across the street from, uh, you know, from the property in question. The next page is, uh, is simply a uh, survey of the property. Um, the gray areas are floodplain. On um, the upper section of the, of the drawing is actually a floodway. That area, we're not proposing to do any development within the floodway at all. Um, in fact, we're proposing to remove some material from the floodway to offset the fill within the floodplain outside of the floodway so there's no net loss in, uh, um, in storage in the, in the floodplain flood itself. The next sheet is this uh, site plan showing what we're proposing right now. Uh, within the zoning, um, 
then the zoning requires a mix of uses, uh, requires both residential and, and commercial uses, and it allows for uh, motor vehicle storage facilities. So this particular plan is showing a, uh, a gas station with a uh, convenience store, a uh, commercial building that uh, we're targeting for a medical use, as well as two small residential buildings accounting for about 48 uh, dwelling units. Uh, they're three-story um, residential units, walk-up type, uh, type buildings. Uh, as I indicated before, all of the development is located outside of the floodway. And you see on this plan an area of uh, soil excavation. That's the area we're proposing to borrow from the floodway to fill the uh, floodplain to get the buildings two feet above the floodplain elevation, which is a uh, requirement of the town. So there'll be no net loss in storage capacity within the floodplain itself. Um, to the right of the drawing through that green space, you'll see a, a walking trail. Um, we're proposing to connect uh, to the Dutchess County Rail Trail, which is right adjacent to the property. Um, there's a natural pathway through that through the woods now that we want to improve to uh, to allow for uh, both the residents of the project as well as the general public to access the rail trail in this location. You'll also see that we propose a sidewalk. Actually, it's within the property, but it follows a long salt point turnpike. Um, there's no point in extending it further to the north because you have that narrow bridge crossing where the rail trail crosses over Salt Point Turnpike, but we'll extend it down to the intersection. And the intersection is proposed to be signalized. We've had uh, several meetings with the Department of Transportation. We've uh, commissioned a traffic impact study. That study is being finalized right now, and that'll be submitted to the Planning Board along with a com you know, complete application package. Um, after meeting with, uh, with um, the supervisor and uh, uh, Councilman Safone, because this is in the fourth ward, it's in his ward. Um, some requests were made with respect to recreational amenities on the project, as well as the orientation of the uh, gas station canopy and convenience store. <coughs> we originally had the gas station canopy in front, which is very traditional for a uh, gas station and convenience store arrangement. We were asked to try and move the canopy towards the rear. We did that, opening up the commercial use of the convenience store a little closer to uh, Salt Point and the canopy to the rear of that. I think, uh, I think this plan works, uh, works quite well, um, given the considerations that we made, so. Thank you. The next page is uh, some preliminary architecture for the, uh, for the convenience store, and that's on the lower right right here. Um, you know, in um, discussions early on with, uh, with the planning boards and town boards consultants, um, they gave us some ideas of what they wanted the architecture to look like. We went back to the architect for the uh, gas station operator and had him uh, revise their concept plans, and this is, this is what they came up with. Frankly, I find it to be very attractive. I think it uh, met the goals of what the town had originally uh, been looking for. So, And on the next page is what we're proposing <laughs> for the residential units. As I indicated, they're three-story breezeway-type buildings. They're walk-up. Um, they're designed to be either um, a combination of one and two and one and three bedroom units, uh, still 24 units in each, in each building. Um, the architecture is act was actually developed while we were developing the architecture for the residential units over at, uh, at Eastdale Village. So you might actually see some, some similarities between uh, what, was, what we're building over there and, and this here. Um, it's not the same unit but it is very similar architecturally so and again you know it's they're they're designed such that they can accommodate um, eight units on each floor but we have a, the ability to have a varied number of bedrooms depending upon the market demands while we're while we're building so. then the next couple pages are just some of the floor plans um it's a little early in the process to really talk about the floor plans for the buildings but uh you know they were being developed while we we're developing the east Elf project so uh so we had them in the package so I figured I would include them. Um, at the back of your package, you've got your existing zoning. Um, and some of you may recall when, when the zoning was proposed to be amended for the McDonald Heights Center District, it was actually proposed for both Salt Point and McDonald Heights. I know the board elected to hold off on acting on the Salt Point Center District modifications. Um, and we're asking the board to consider making those changes now. Most of the changes that are in here, and they're, they're recorded as track changes, so you can see you know, what we were recommending they, the, that uh, the board consider, mirror what was done in, uh, in the McDonald Heights Center District. The one principal difference is that 
Um, in this particular district, um, we felt that with the type of area it is, with the, the commuter traffic going in towards the colleges and whatnot from the northeast corner of the, uh, of the county, that it was more conducive to, have, to allow drive-throughs in this particular location. Um, and it was very important to the gas station operator that we talked to that uh, should the canopy have to be moved to the rear, if they can get that drive-through, it would be very helpful. And I understand that there's been other applicants within the Salt Point Center District that have spoken to the town about uh, modifying the zoning to include, uh, to include a drive-through, and we're very supportive of that. Some of the other changes that we proposed, you know, since, since we're required to have a mix of residential and uh, uh, commercial development, we proposed to move uh, multifamily dwellings into a permitted use as opposed to a special permitted use. We also proposed to adjust the height, the maximum height of the residential buildings for, you know, um, in the McDonald Heights Center District, which I believe is uh, what we've mirrored here. It's, you're allowed up to 50 feet or three and a half stories. We, we retained uh, two and a half story to three story buildings at McDonald Heights and we're much less than 50 feet. So we're proposing to make that same change here because if we stay with two stories to get the same number of units, we're gonna have to occupy more area of the, of the site. We felt we were able to keep more, more area of the site green by going, uh, well, going up one more floor. And this section I on uh, page seven was really to tie the whole project together. I don't know if you recall, but one of the, the issues that we ran into with McDonald Heights is since this had originally been proposed as a separate section, it wasn't read and interpreted as, as applying to the whole project, which kind of defeated the intent of trying to create a mixed-use project. Um, so this was the change that was made for the McDonald Heights Center District that tied all of that together that actually obligated an applicant to come in with a mixed-use project as opposed to just coming in with a single-use project on, uh, on a piece of property. We adjusted some of the, uh, the percentage requirements. Uh, McDonald Heights went from 20% of the gross square footage had to be non-residential. Um, it was reduced to 15. I would consider the town might want to reduce that in this particular location since it's a different type of town center than what was created at McDonald Heights. Um, but either way, we're fine with it, but the town might want to consider, uh, consider something, uh, something less. Um, And there was also some changes made to the McDonald Heights Center District that allowed for an open area development such that not all properties had to have frontage on a public road. Um, that was uh, very readily accepted by the board. I propose that language in here, although in this particular application, all the properties, all the parcels that we're going to create will actually have frontage, so it's not really necessary for our project. But since we are trying to replicate what was done at McDonald Heights, we incorporated it in this, in this draft text amendment. I think that's the, uh, the crux of most of the changes that we were proposing for the district. It's a very good project. Uh, I know since you've uh, come to us, a lot of other people, as you mentioned, have wanted to develop on that strip. So uh, it needs a little uh, up, uh, sprucing up and uh, some more business in there would be great. So I like this one. I'm glad you put some of the amenities in there we talked about. Good. Uh, everybody good. else likes it as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm glad to see, though, that you re want to reduce the amount of commercial in it because retail has really changed in this country. Right. And there's no point building storefronts that are going to remain empty. And I believe there are still some empty strip shopping centers out in this area. Have they all pretty much? Oh, awful. There's one in yeah. Over on Creek, there's actually yeah. some new construction that's yeah. still, still vacant. Yeah, so. they're, they're filling that up right now. Yeah. Because there were some that were having Around the corner, yes. Yeah, yeah. difficulties, but since so changed. But still, yeah. retail is changing in this yeah. country, and right and now we effect. seem to be just moving the pieces around in the town. Right. Yeah, creating an empty space where they leave from. Well, that's one of the reasons that we were targeting for the additional commercial use uh, of medical use there. Yeah. yeah we're, we're talking to several medical uh, institutions in the area about the possibility of an urgent care or similar type facility in that location. Okay. Would you build that building if you don't have somebody? No. no. So. No. Okay. We would not build it. It will be reserved for, uh, for future construction, but until there's a tenant for the building, yeah. I don't think it serves anybody's uh, benefit that we build That's, something and it remain vacant. So Yeah, that, that makes sense. And also, I agree with you, too, trying to keep as much green space as possible. 
and yeah. going up another story makes sense. Yeah. We think it's a, it's, a, it's a great amenity for the residents of this area as well as the, uh, the residents of the area as a whole. Um, you know, and providing the access to the rail trail, we think it'll be very well received and it'll get utilized. So. Yep. And of course, we did change the town code about distance between gas stations, but I'm sure this is correct that you were <coughs> the correct. Yeah, this actually does reflect the correct the, screening in and the correct distance. Yes, yeah. yes. this meets, meets the requirement based upon the interpretations that were made previously. Okay. So. Good. Rich, your conversation with the light, what kind of changes are they making? Well, right now it's a, it's a three-way signalized intersection. We're proposing to add a fourth um, leg to that, uh, that signal. Um, the analysis that was done by our traffic consultants indicated that the level of service is still more than adequate for, uh, uh, for that, that uh, signal to be upgraded. Um, we would anticipate the signal is going to have to be replaced entirely. We were, of course, hoping that it would just be a matter of hanging, <laughs> hanging another uh, um, you know, signal on the existing span, but, uh, but we'll be upgrading the signal itself entirely. There will be turn lanes to go into the site from the city of Poughkeepsie, as well as the D-cell lane uh, coming from uh, you know, Salt Point. Anybody else? No. no? If not, thanks. We'll get back to you. Very good. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. I look forward to working with the board. If you have any other questions about the uh, zoning, and then if you can, you know, let me know, uh, you know when we might be able to expect, uh, you know, yep. the, some action on the zoning amendment. Yep. That'd be we'll great. have Mr. Welty reach out to you. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome, sir. Thanks, Rich. Good job. Next presentation is Hudson Heritage Sewer. Oh, got a lot going on here. Where's that presentation? Plug it in so it not run next or no, I I'm done. And you're done. Larger? <laughs> <laughs> can you can no, Mike, Michael? Mike, can you make it the whole screen? Oh, well, um, do you have a PowerPoint version? Or, I don't know. Okay. I think this will, if you just expand yeah. it. Okay. Or maybe not. Let's try. Or Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Martin Berger, I'm principal of Sabre Real Estate Advisors and the development manager of, uh, of EFG Sabre um, uh, SC LLC, which is a developer and owner of Hudson Heritage. And we just uh, recently received uh, planning board approval for our project to go forward with phase one for site plan approval, as well as uh, overall subdivision. And the property in summary is about 350, development, excuse me, in summary is about 350,000 square feet of commercial and 750 uh, residential units of various types. And we're about ready to uh, get going with the project. In fact, if you've gone by the property, you'll see that the trees are cleared, the buildings are being cleared of uh, asbestos and, and about to start uh, being demolished. The uh, sewer system on the property has been historically, has been owned by the state. And just in a nutshell, what's happened is, is that the sewer lines have had major, major failures over the past 10 years that basically has, the state has put a finger in a dike. There's almost 10 million gallons a day of infiltration into the pipes. We've had major failures. And in fact, two weeks ago, there was another significant failure of the pipe. And the state came in, spent about two and a half weeks of trying to clean it up. It's of utmost importance because the sewer lines run right into the Hudson River, and they also run into the um, water intake for the town of Poughkeepsie, as well as the city of Poughkeepsie. In dealing with the state, saying, how are we going to clean this up, their solution is, well, you can wait about 5 or 10 or 15 years and we'll get to it, or um, what we will do is, through our sister entity, EFC, Environmental Finance Corp., we will um, generate uh, a loan, uh, which the town could be the applicant for, to go ahead and uh, replace the sewer system. And you, uh, being the, can form a new uh, sewer district and pay it back over a period of time. And in addition to that, because it's so, it scores so high on the priority list, um, they 
uh, have offered a state subsidy where the interest rate will be quite low. So in a nutshell, that's uh, what we're, we're talking about, and we're, we're here tonight to discuss with you the um, specifically ask you to proceed with us to allow us to form a sewer district, to petition the board to form a sewer district, which will serve only Hudson Heritage, and then to proceed, of course, with the completion of the application that the town authorized to proceed with a bond uh, resolution in order to uh, finance the, the project. We have worked over the past uh, five or six months with the town staff and council, um, and, and our council, Peter Wise, and, and Victor Cornelius, our, our grant writer, to understand what's involved with it, what the timing is, what the risks are. And um, I think at this point, we've done a fairly good job of identifying um, the, the risks as well as being able to mitigate the risks. So what I'd like to do is just walk you through a very quick presentation that gives a little bit of background, some facts and figures, identifies what we collectively, your staff and our staff, has identified as the risks, as well as what we propose to be the proper mitigation or mitigants for the risk. Uh, okay. Mike, a little help? <laughs> Technical support. <laughs> That's why he ran away. Down, down, down arrow. Okay. Tommy broke it. Victor, can you come with somebody help him? Just uh, okay. Bear with me. Oh, I see. It's not there. Down, down arrow. Victor, can you add in from? I'll I'll tell you yeah, one. Um, so. Basically, the uh, site has been uh, closed in the early uh, uh, 2000s, and there's been all sorts of uh, challenges on this particular site. The site was left a mess by the state. Medical records were all over, debris in every single building, uh, asbestos, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, these challenges create significant upfront costs to be incurred above and beyond those that are typically associated with the large development of this site. We've already invested $15 million, and we will be investing another $15 million. But our money so far has gone to implement safety security on site. Uh, we've stabilized the historic buildings. There are six buildings that are going to be remained. We've cleared out all of the six buildings, including the administration building of the fire debris, so on and so forth. And um, we've cleaned up the past uh, sewer failures. Some of the buildings had uh, three to six feet of effluent sitting in the basements uh, from time to time. Can you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Our uh, development will, of course, produce a significant amount of uh, construction and permanent jobs. It will also take the taxes from about 80000 a year to over $8 million a year, of which about $7 million plus comes directly to the town uh, in terms of the school district and the town, the Fairview Fire Department and lighting and so on and so forth. And our development, of course, will provide much needed uh, facilities to support the continuing economic expansion in the county, particularly of uh, Vassar Medical and Marist College, by providing a hotel and conference center, uh, a new uh, lifelong, lifelong learning and arts facility, um, housing for 750 uh, various uh, dwelling units, child care, uh, medical office, retail restaurants, and grocery. In fact, as you'll hear, we're about 75% pre-leased of all of our retail space. We also are, um, uh, have significant community benefits. We're preserving six of the former HRPC buildings. We're reutilizing them. Uh, we are keeping in preserved state 69 acres of, uh, of open area. And uh, we are creating 8.64 miles of, of um Trailways and walking paths, which will be open to the, to the public as well throughout the throughout the site. Next one, please. As I mentioned to date, we've there we go. to date we've uh, stabilized the site. We've cleared the site. We're, we've cleaned out the buildings. We are uh, seventy five percent pre leased, including a sixty five thousand square foot anchor tenant. Uh, and another 30, 40,000 square feet of uh, smaller shop tenants. We also have our financing in place. We've uh, and and 
uh, for the construction of the first 88,000 square feet of our buildings. And our anchor tenant will be financing their own building. Next slide. The next steps on our schedule are to, um, uh, are to complete the demolition of the south buildings. Uh, two of the buildings will start coming down in the next two weeks. And the third building, the largest, which is the Cheney, will come down in about uh, 90 days. We're ready to proceed with uh, all of the site and, and, and off-site work, which includes the installation of two new traffic lights along Route 9. We're ready to proceed with the grading. The sewer system replacement can, be, can proceed. And uh, we are about going to start a small segment of the sewer, which will be privately held because it doesn't privately develop because it doesn't benefit the uh, users of Hudson Heritage, which connects the CIA to a, to a new line along Route 9. Next slide, please. So the major uh, development challenge that we have at this time is the, is the, is the con sewer system. Construction cannot begin without a clear, committed path and timeline for a functioning sewer system. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned to you, because of the failures of the existing system by the state, the solution that's uh, most likely the best to occur is the, um, is the funding through this Clean Water uh, Revolving Fund, which is only available to the town as the applicant. It's not available to the private developer. Um, the construction loan is for 100% of the construction costs of the system itself. It then converts into a 30-year self-amortizing loan. As I mentioned, the project does qualify for a 50% interest subsidy. And the debt service, the debt is serviced with sewer tax revenue assessed only to the properties benefited, which are only the properties within Hudson Heritage. There'll be no cost to anyone outside of Hudson Heritage. Again, the town must be the borrower. Next page. The sewer system itself will replace the existing lines, which are shown in red. And the sewer system will also extend service to the new subdivided parcels, which are in blue. The only work in the new area that the town will be funding is the main trunk line, the sewer line itself. All of the other work, including the excavation, all of the other utilities throughout the entire system, and the paving of the roads in the blue for the new is all private development. So the only thing that the bond covers is the replacement of the line and the restoration of the roads that existed heretofore and the expansion of the main trunk lines into the new development. Everything else is privately funded. Next, please. I can either skip over this. The system itself uh, has been uh, estimated at $10.8 million. It includes, as you'll see here, significant soft cost allowance as well as uh, a significant contingency. All of the drawings have been um, uh, completed at this point in time. And of course, the process will be that the town will review it and put it out to its own RFP and bid and then monitor the, project, the construction on a going forward, going forward basis. As I said, the debt is uh, amortized over 30 years, and um, uh, the debt service, assuming a zero subsidy, is $660,000 per year. Uh, while there is a subsidy in the analysis, we've assumed zero subsidy. Again, at full build-out, the property owners will include the commercial subdivisions, the multifamily housing, and the individual residents, all of whom will benefit from the upgrades, and all of whom will be taxed appropriately to cover the debt service. Next page. So the, the, the steps that have to be going at, going f proceed at this point in time is that we would respectfully request uh, that you'll accept our petition and look favorably upon to form the district, uh, which has to be formally done before the uh, loan application to, could go in. And then the second part, of what we're going to be requesting, of course, is to have the town f complete the application and proceed with the issuance of the uh, bond resolution. Next the, in, 
terms of risk, um, the, the obvious concern is that the developer or, or the users won't pay the uh, sewer taxes due to a lack of development. In this particular case, we are building the buildings prior to the sewer system coming online or even being started. Um, so by the time the sewer construction starts, our buildings will be up, our buildings will be occupied, the, excuse me, the commercial uh, buildings will be up in phase one, they'll be occupied, and they will have a demonstration of income that's in place adequate to cover the debt service. So there's a significant protection there as well. The second chart, which uh, is, so the top chart shows in orange the uh, debt service payment, and in blue it shows the um, annual rent from our phase one commercial projects. And you can see uh, from the point of the green line forward that we have significant income in place, in fact, $5 million of rental income to cover $650,000 of debt service. And since the sewer, like real estate tax liens, take first priority, uh, there's the tremendous coverage should it need be. Need be. And the chart on the bottom shows the asset value. It shows basically that we will have built $97 million of buildings, uh, which will act as security for the $11 million, $10.8 million bond offering. And the way that we're able to create the, uh, to get the buildings up ahead of the sewer system is with the cooperation of, of your town staff, we've been able to come up with a temporary line that will allow our commercial buildings to access directly to the existing sewer line that we will replace with private dollars along Route 9 at the southerly intersection by the sewer meter pit. Um, while that's a good solution to get us started, it's not going to accomplish, accommodate the entire development as the entire development, the sewer system, needs to uh, continue through to connect to 9G. Uh, further, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the, the financial assurance, um, we have uh, agreed to fund upfront a debt service, uh, to provide a debt service guarantee fund and to actually place in, in, in a escrow account uh, an amount of money equal to the full annual debt service payment until so, such time as the buildings are up and they're generating sufficient rental income to cover the debt service payment. So in addition to the assets, you have that liquid, liquid cash account. This chart here basically shows you the other, the other protection and interested parties that are supportive of the project and basically are subordinate to, uh, to the town's position. Uh, there's $28 million minimum of, uh, of cash that, we've invest that we will have invested in the project by the before the sewer system starts. There's another $42 million of our construction financing, which comes from uh, M&T Bank. There's $20 million of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the anchors funds that are going in. And there's seven million dollars of imputed value, so it's about ninety-one million dollars that sits behind the sewer uh, bond, uh, which is be ten point eight million dollars. Meaning that this ninety-eight million dollars theoretically it's wiped out if, in fact, the sewer tax doesn't get paid. So I would like to say that we, nor the bank, nor the anchor tenants lender, or any of us, are going to uh, let this let 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 our assets be lost because of a minor sewer uh, tax payment. So I think there's a significant amount of um, security in first, uh, the debt service guarantee, and second, the uh, deposit uh, that uh, will be in, placed in escrow in, in, a, in cash or letter of credit, combined with the um, uh, assets that are placed behind you and the interested invested parties behind you. Next one. So the net benefits are basically that this broken sewer system, which is uh, uh, spilling into the waterways uh, with, at a significant rate, will be corrected in a very timely manner and, and in a permanent manner. And by the town proceeding with the, uh, with the New York EFC funding, um, we will be able to use our dollars to where we're, where we're dedicated to using them, which is the vertical development and the site improvements and bring the project on much earlier. 
The earlier you would bring it on, the earlier the town takes the taxes from eight million, eight eighty thousand to eight point, I think it's eight point four million dollars. You're not asking for a pilot agreement. I'm sorry. You're not asking for any kind of pilot agreements. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, are there any questions that I can answer? <coughs> Anybody got any questions at this time? Oh. No. I just asked the board members to reach out to Mike Welty and Jim Nelson and set time to go over how we got to this point. You know, I think the presentation was very well done, but it wasn't an overnight process to get to this. It took a lot to get to this point. So what Marty has shown us, I think we still have to we still have to sit down and discuss with the board members exactly how we got to this point. There's a lot of concerns going on. We think we've addressed a lot of the concerns, but the board has to feel comfortable that this is money that's going to be borrowed in the town's name to make sure we're comfortable going forward if this is the direction that they want to go. With your permission, I'll, I'd like to uh, distribute these to the board members. It's this presentation with a lot more details that would be perhaps helpful in your uh, detailed understanding of how we've gotten to where we are Thank and you. what the protections are. Thanks, Ronnie. I have two for the missing. I'll take two for the missing people. <coughs> so I need one more. Yes, it's okay. Yes, for three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. That takes us to the end of our presentations for the night. Uh, I'd like to go on the committee reports. By advisor. John, no report. Government operations. Nothing to report this time. Land use and planning. I do know they had their first meeting today, but Mr. Carlos um, fell ill in between the meeting and now. So he'll give his report next month. Personnel. Well, we've been conducting interviews for the last couple of days for the uh, part-time clerk in the rec department. Hopefully we'll have a decision very soon. Infrastructure? Nothing to report. No. Supervisor report. Yeah, you skipped REC. <laughs> oh, man. Honest one. Oh. How did you miss REC? Yeah, and it's going to be really, really brief. Okay. Because they're happy to report that the basketball court at Greenville has been completed. So construction of that is done and the new hoops are up. And that they're planning on the rest of the basketball courts will be done by the end of the month. So we'll be all ready for the end of school with our basketball courts. And as for playground resurfacing, crown uh, Heights Playground is nearly completed, and Greenvale will be done within the next week. And day camp is 85% filled, so they're getting ready for that. And um, the Tuesday concerts start June 25th, and the first one will be the Greyhounds. So that's at Greenvale Park, 7 o'clock? Yes. Yes. First one's yes. I can just add one thing. Uh, the new swings are coming in at Fairview in the next couple of weeks. Parts have been ordered. It uh, costs about $2,000, and the whole thing is going to be replaced. Okay. And then as far as the senior centers, they had a bus trip in May to Albany, and the bus trip this month was to the Carousel Museum and the Museum of Fire History in Connecticut. And next month, they're going to go to the steam train uh, river boat trip. So that's it. And then they also put in a pad down at um, Greenville for soccer. So as they come in, it's not a dirt path anymore. They blacktop part of that, and they're getting ready to put a concrete base underneath the pavilion down there. Yes, and they're putting the concrete base we, underneath we, the pavilion down below. And we finally got our okay from the Board of Health for the bathrooms at Greenville, and the bathrooms are just about ordered to be ready to come in, and that'll probably be the end of the summer project. Yeah, this can be end. They've just put the bid out for that, yeah. so yes. And the bid, I think the bid was just open the other day for over Rocker. the park and over Rocker Road. Mm -hmm. yep. So hopefully that'll get started in the next couple of months, so we see some progress. As far as this month, um, I attended the tri Muni Commission meeting. Um, it's a sewer plan located in the south end of town along with Jeff. We had a meeting with um, Mayor Rollison in reference to the Joint Water Board and other things as far as shared services, what we can do going forward there. We attended a Joint Water Board meeting, and it looks like a lot of our Water Board issues are coming to a close. So hopefully that's going in the right direction. 
We uh, met Tri-Municipal Sewer Commission, went to operators' meetings because they had a few older complaints down there, and we're discussing some major upgrades down there. And most of the grant money that we get down there are applied to shared service grants because that plant's owned by the Village of Wappingers Falls and the Town of Poughkeepsie, and the Town of Wappinger is actually a, the, our biggest tenant there. So between the three, we're trying to take care of all our I&I &I and things down that way. We held a department head meeting, which was very lengthy this month because it was extremely busy. It's amazing that the town went from zero speed to almost high speed overnight. And we introduced Jennifer, who's our new assessor, taking over for Kathy Tabor, who will be retiring at the end of the month. And we hired, um, started Tuesday, we hired a new um, deputy uh, zoning administrator who will be going out doing our enforcement while our deputy, while our zoning administrator currently is out on leave for a few months. Um, about nine or 10 of us went to a community resilience building workshop out in Pleasant Valley um, to discuss all the different issues with the different towns to see you know, what we had. I think Ann attended that, Mike Welty, water was there, sewer, and we went from sea level rise to sewer plants to water plants to just any other issue that we could have to try to find a way that we can address all these issues. And that sort of walks back into Climate Smart Communities Pledge and getting all those things up and running. It's all one piece that they all work together. So that all seems to be coming together. Um, two weeks ago, we had a place of worship awareness training. We had eight, 18 different preachers, ministers, nuns, etc., came in and uh, the uh, community policing officer trained them on things to be aware of, and he just opened a dialogue with them. So going forward, if there's any issues they need or security issues they need to have addressed or they always want him to look at and advise, we opened that door frame up and that lasted about two hours and that went over very well and had a very good rapport with him. Mitchell Associates, who's doing our um, consolidated study, met the other day myself and uh, Mike Welty and I said within the next month we should have a presentation on that. That seems to be coming to a close. We attended um, a Memorial Day ceremony at New Hampshire Yacht Club and as always want to thank them for Phenomenal job that they do down there by hosting that. And they also had one of Wappinger's Falls that was run by um, Mayor Chase. And then we held ours at the Dutchess County War Memorial in conjunction with um, Dutchess County. And there we made the announcement of the hometown heroes that Kayla Basha from um, Ketchum came in a few months ago. And she discussed that we we're going to do a hometown heroes project and to honor all our vets and hang flags to Arlington and hopefully through most of the town. And she had the students at um, Ketchum Art Department designed the flags, and she worked with the American Legion out here on Over Rocker Road to get going and get the, f the first honorees. And Stu was our first, one of our first honorees, 102 years old, and he attended the event that day, which was great. And I had a monthly um, round, town, round table discussion with the seniors on issues that they may have or things going on at the senior center every month, and that seems to be going pretty well. After that, there was nothing else to do. I make a motion to suspend the rules for any comment on either anything that they saw tonight, listened to tonight, or anything in general with the town. But I just ask anybody to come up to please try to keep it to three minutes. Second. All those in favor? All right. Aye. Anybody like to come up and discuss anything that was discussed tonight or anything in relation to the town at all? Welcome. Good evening. Um, my name is Jenny Colabella, and I'm here tonight to ask the board to preserve the Williams House at Brasser College. Um, Williams House is an important part of our history. It was the first dedicated housing for women at Brasser, and at that time it was an all-women's college. Um, and as we know, history is a large part of what makes us who we are, and Williams House is an important part of that for us. Um, it's a direct link to the woman who lived and worked here 100 years ago, so important for us. And um, I think that it's important to preserve it instead of rolling over for a parking lot if we've investigated other options. Um, I think important. It's a large part of our history, and I think it hasn't been explored, the preservation of it, and I would like the board to consider that before we lose it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Hi, my name is Julie Zabo, and I'm a, 
a Poughkeepsie resident, a Vassar, member of extended Vassar community, and uh, part of the coalition to save Williams. And uh, I'm speaking partially for my husband, who's a professor at, um, who can't be here tonight, Luke Huntsberger, who um, uh, is who formed this committee. And I just want to say a couple of things um, in in uh, contrast to the presentation. First of all. Um, there are 21 households that live in Williams Complex, and Vassar has a total crisis in faculty housing. So there, there is a possible plan to build uh, commercial development somewhere for housing, but so far there's nothing definite. And basically what this plan is doing is taking a quiet, residential, pedestrian community and changing it into something else. And I think the board really has to think about this. Because uh, right now, the 21 households that live there and the quiet street that lines it, um, we are the ones that support that business district. We are the ones who go to my market and to the restaurants and to the different places. And it creates a pedestrian environment. Uh, the inn, the 50-room inn, is a commercial venture. And so there's a reason why the town code does not allow commercial ventures into an academic environment, that that commercial venture is going to have to support itself. And even though they represented that the Inn and Institute will bring guests, it's not a constant flow of guests. And even the, the people who come to visit the college don't come constantly. So then what does the Inn do in the meantime? And some of the community members that are part of coalition are very concerned about weddings and other commercial uses of this hotel and the type of traffic and the type of impact that will have on that street that we live on. Now, the second thing is that I have a little packet for everybody which details how Vassar came to this decision of, of creating this hotel and why. And partially it is because a trustee has donated $30 million and this is what they want. And why? where do they want it? They want it near the alumni house. There are alternative sites that are better for, for the town of Poughkeepsie, particularly along College View Avenue. And this is something that my husband is currently involved in a struggle with Vassar to try to get them to consider this. And the argument really is, is that if you, I mean, it's in my little packet too, the, the, the thing is that if they really want to help the commercial district to create a, a viable pedestrian district, and there are problems there, restaurants are closing, stores are, can't keep up, all this different stuff, then why not site this in an institute across the street from it? You know, I, I realize that the traffic circle, the first site, one of the reasons they originally put it on the first site was because uh, that, that people would walk across the street to the stores. But uh, on the right side of College Avenue, along where there's a, a bunch of trees and there's a whole bunch of tennis courts, that's, that would actually create a, play, a pedestrian situation. And you still have the pedestrians from Williams Complex who wouldn't lose their historic home. The second thing I want to point out is that the town um, created a survey of historic properties that was actually commissioned a few years ago, and Williams is on the list of potential historic properties that the town, the town survey, um, it was a consultant that was hired by Woodstock. Uh, he lives in Woods, from Woodstock, but I, 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 I can't remember the name right now, but I can let you guys know. So there's these two things. There's no reason to pull down this historic uh, building to build a parking lot. There's no, uh, displace the people there, change the residential environment of that street, and not, if they are going to create something, why not help the town of Arlington? Why not create a pedestrian situation where, you know, I think the, the likelihood of somebody walking across the park, and meanwhile they're disrupting the community garden. Uh, I mean, not the community garden. The, the one important place that the community and the Vassar community intersects, which is the farmer's market. So even though you know, the current plan allows for a market, there will be disruption due to, uh, due to uh, the construction. So it doesn't seem to make sense to me or, or to the rest of us who are involved in this coalition. So thank you for listening. Thank and you. I have a little thing I'll pass out to each of you. you so, can just give including the, the history of uh, 
of Harriet Williams, who was the donor, whose husband was one of these people who really had ideas about creating workers' housing and all this stuff. But anyway, it's all in the packet if you're interested in the history. Right, thank you. You just hand them to Felicia. She'll hang them up, hand them up here. Yeah, and the historic um, survey was done by Neil Larson. Oh, yes, Neil Larson. Neil Larson, yeah. Mr. Doxey? Come up, Mr. Doxey. Commissioner Doxey, how are you tonight? Good evening, sir. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, Jimmy Doxey, 55 Buckingham Avenue, Town of Poughkeepsie, uh, Commissioner for Every Fire District. Uh, thank you for allowing us to have open comments tonight. Tonight, I'm here to support uh, large print, so I should be able to get through this pretty quick. <laughs> uh, we're here to support the uh, the project for the sewer district for the Hudson Heritage. Um, this project has been in the making for four years now. Last week was the approval for the shovels that were finally able to be applied to this property. Thank you very much for approving that. Um, all the commissioners, all five commissioners, fully support the Hudson Heritage developers. Uh, we thank them for remaining positive and not losing heart and moving forward to complete phase one of this project. Uh, a few weeks ago, it was stated uh, phase one was estimated to be completed on time. It was also stated that phase two is necessary to, uh, rec to recoup the more than $12 million deficit that they will have after they complete phase one. Um, we applaud the developers for being forthright with all parties concerned and remain committed to the project in its entirety. The Great Mansion fire added to that deficit a few weeks ago. They stated to the town that that structure uh, will be completely have a new roof and not just a temporary roof put on it. Um, those were heavy unexpected costs to Hudson Heritage, yet their commitments from the development still remain very positive. There's been full transparency on this project with the town engineers, the building department, the highway department, the Fairview Fire District commissioners, and Fairview Fire Chief Christopher Mater, who you have comments from uh, Chief Mater, Mike, Mr. Stephone, right, Mike? Uh, I've, uh, you had he's a, very a conversation much, with him? Yes, he's the very The chief much regrets not being here tonight. He's at a uh, chief's conference up in Syracuse with, uh, with, with Captain Gilnack, mm -hmm. and we'll return tomorrow. Um, but we have full support from Chief Mater on this project. So, Hopefully, have you uh, okay the sewer the sewer proposal that uh, Marty had brought to us tonight? Um, it is imperative that the town moves on this sewer approvals immediately, if not sooner, as to not hinder any further development of this property. Um, the Fairview Fire District had been waiting for this project for a long time. There's been two previous developers for this project that have now failed, and Hudson Heritage is the only company that has brought this property to fruition. All the residents of the Fairview Fire District, and I truly mean all of the residents, all 2,200 households, 2,200 residential homes, I have had zero opposition from anybody about this particular project that's coming in. And you know I've had many oppositions, and Absolutely. you've heard my voices clearly through the years of projects that have been brought into the, into the district. Um, this one we wholeheartedly endorse, and I'm hoping the town will do so too. Um, this is one of the few projects that will actually boost enough, refu enough revenue to aid in the district in its capabilities to, pr to provide human health and safety and not increase the cost to our district taxpayers. The taxpayers will actually see a relief for the first time in many, many, many years, over 30 that I know of, that there will be a reduction in the cost to the district, to the Fairview Fire District taxpayers, um, and we will be in our estimate, below what Arlington is currently paying. So we are still the highest taxpayers over Arlington, even though we come in at 4.5 square miles of, of district. I want to thank the town boards, the town of Poughkeepsie, all the departments of the town of Poughkeepsie, and especially our sincere thanks to Hudson Heritage for continuing the transparency and the commitment to our community. Thank you. Thank, thank thanks, Mr. And Chris did um, give his support. He called the other day. Thank you. Yes. Anybody else? Commissioner? Nothing? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you could have sat next to him. Right. <laughs> he did that for a reason. <laughs> All right. Uh, make a motion to resume the rules? A second. Well, is anybody else want to speak? No. I guess not. No. Okay. No. Make a motion to resume the rules? 
All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Second. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Motion to adjourn. Meeting closed at 849. Thank you, everybody, for your time and effort.